Well, thank you very much. I've asked them to turn up the volume in the back because I have a cold. We have two things working against us. I'm getting over a cold, and you've just eaten and are getting tired. So I'm going to try to uh, just summarize what I've been trying to do in this paper. And for more details, you can read all of it. But I'm trying to accomplish two things. One is tackle a, a difficult text, which is 2 Corinthians 3, 1 through 4, 6. There are several things in the text which are controversial both, uh, are debated both in the church and then among critical scholars, people who are unbelievers, and among denominational people. Wherever you're coming from, there's going to be different problems with this text. Now, the second thing I'm trying to do <coughs> is uh, present a methodology that we can use for difficult text. And it's similar to what I did last year on Daniel 12, which is trying to do an intertextual, just, just a textual analysis, or looking at themes, looking at context, looking for things that unify the, 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 the document that can help us uh, determine <coughs> an uh, interpretation that is valid. Uh, there's a lot of interpretations available. Uh, which ones are valid? And you read one commentator and they say one thing, and you read another commentator and they say something else. So let me grab a water and I'll be right back. I need this to get through it. So first of all, I should have given this to somebody else to advance these. Can I give this to you, Patrick? Sure. You advance these as I reach this, because I'll forget about it. So really I want to, you know, I think looking at a brief history of interpretation will be helpful. Uh, we don't get our authority from historical, from the history of interpretation of a text, but it's interesting and, and it sometimes can uh, bring us in check on, on, we're not the only people that have looked at a passage, you know, since it's been written, and, and it's kind of helpful to see this. Historically, there's been two different main views of looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 3. <clears throat> you got the letter spirit controversy, what does that mean? And you also got this veil of Moses, what does that mean? Uh, was it fading? What was the purpose of this veil? Uh, there, there's, there's two different uh, main debates that have occurred throughout the years. In the early history of the church, from what we have writings of, there, there were these two debates. One was a distinction between the literal sense of Scripture, a literal reading of Scripture, and a uh, spiritual reading of Scripture, or an allegorical reading of Scripture. <clears throat> you may be familiar with that. That's the Letter of the letter of the text versus the spirit of the text. Is that a literal meaning versus an allegorical reading? <coughs> the other one is, it's a distinction between the Old Testament and the New Testament. The letter and the spirit is a distinction between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And that was popularized or became the dominant view during the Reformation. But before the Reformation, it was the allegorical. Everybody went to this text to prove an allegorical interpretation. So I just want you to know that the current predominant view, which is Old Testament versus New Testament, has not always been the most dominant view, but it, it's the one I hold and the one I argue for in this paper. <clears throat> now, the modern debate here among different people, some people say that Paul is just, he, he the way he deals with Old Testament uh, verses in his writings is out of context from the original Old Testament passage. <laughs> Excuse me. And we've all wrestled with this. You're, you're reading an Old Testament text, and you get, it, you get one meaning from it. You, under, you think you understand that Old Testament text. And then you're reading the New Testament, and it uses a quote from that Old Testament text, and you're saying, what? I didn't, I didn't even get that when I used to read that. Is he, is he completely taken out of context? So the critical scholars, the unbelievers, say, well, Paul just making up things as he goes along. Other people say, well, he was influ influenced by Jewish commentators during his day. Maybe he was. <clears throat> Other people say, well, he was preaching the right doctrines from the wrong text, but we can believe him anyway because he was an apostle. In other words, we can trust what he, where he goes. I have those. Thank you. And they don't help. <laughs> I've, I've been using them all day. That's the, uh, that was the first thing we had against us, remember? And the second thing is you're tired. So some people say, well, we can, uh, we can, even though we can't use the same approach to interpreting Scripture, the same hermeneutical approach today as Paul does, we can trust that because he was an apostle, we can trust what he's doing with these Old Testament texts. 
And then there's, there's an approach to which I'm going to propose in this paper that is, I think, a way forward, which is if we look at a broader context of these Old Testament passages, not just what they're quoting, but look at the broader context of the Old Testament book, that he's not necessarily taking them out of context, but he's quoting them from a broader perspective of what's going on in those Old Testament books. <clears throat> and so I'm kind of summarizing up to point one here. Uh, the second thing is I want to look at some themes. We talked about this briefly earlier in the day. <coughs> this is not an exhaustive list, but I want to propose this, and we can discuss it more in the Q&A period. There's a theme of commendation, which I want to propose, first of all, which this is used. Um, I, I mentioned all the references, the, the verse references there on page 3.3. That he uses the word commendation. It's a strong argument here, which I think is probably the strongest argument is this theme for a unified letter. If you want an argument for a unified Second Corinthians against the, 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 the critics who say it's a fragmented letter, or even one that was written at different times, uh, I think the themes that run throughout it, even though he changes in his writing style, the, the, the themes are very persuasive to me that it's one contiguous. Uh, argument that he's making. And this, this idea of commendation, in your translation you'll say recommendation in some, in some verses. And the, and the modern translations, I'm not smarter than the translators. Don't, I don't want to appear that way. <clears throat> but a lot of times they don't preserve the, same, the, the consistent translation of Greek words to help us see these kind of themes as we're going through. And you know, I, I know Jeff can tell you, I know just enough Greek to be dangerous with it. But, but I, I made this argument a couple years ago when I was talking on 1 Corinthians 11. And if you have an ESV Bible or others, you know how man-woman is not consistently translated. That's one example, how it goes man-woman, then may say husband and wife. <clears throat> Same thing here in this letter with these, some of these words, commendation being one of them. The other theme that we need to look at is sufficiency. He says that <clears throat> several times uh, in chapter 2 and verse 6, he says that, he asks a question, who is sufficient for these things? And then that same word is going to be used again in chapter 3 and verse 5 and 6. And um, Paul's sufficiency in both passages, this is parallel thoughts, so that his sufficiency comes from God. In both of those passages, sufficiency comes from God. Now this is likely, maybe in his mindset here, he's, he's kind of likening back to the call of different prophets who were called in spite of their weaknesses. Moses, he's going to go on to compare his ministry with Moses, so we'll just look at Moses as an example. If you look at the Septuagint version of Exodus chapter 3, the, the idea of, or the, the story about Moses meeting the Lord in a burning bush and being called to ministry. <clears throat> in our Bibles, Moses... Um, his apprehension is something along the lines of he says, I'm not eloquent or I'm not a man of words. <coughs> in the Septuagint, it's very interesting. He says, I'm not sufficient. And so if this is the, this is the translation that, that Paul has in mind, which is, seems to be what he's using when he quotes other Old Testament texts in this passage, he may have Moses' ministry in mind. Um, he's not comparing himself to... Um, or presenting himself as the fulfillment of the one that would come, like Moses talked about, but he seems to be using the, the call of Moses to validate his own ministry. Even though Moses and other prophets were insufficient in themselves, they're made sufficient by God. And that's what Paul's trying to say. This, this pattern would provide a strong defense for his ministry. And if God used Moses and others in spite of their weaknesses, then the Corinthians can't use <coughs> his weakness as an argument against him for his or disqualify him as an apostle. Now it appears that the Corinthians were struggling between this definition of sufficiency and what these other teachers, whoever they are, <coughs> were trying to present as sufficient. They were presenting letters of recommendation or proving their sufficiency by their means. But a letter of recommendation would not have made Paul any more of an apostle because his sufficiency came from God. The third theme I want us to look at is ministry, which has been mentioned many times earlier in the other text that we've discussed today. Uh, it comes up here, I think it's introduced in chapter 3 and verse 3, when the letter itself was a letter that was ministered by Paul. He says, you're our letter, and he, he 
in some trends, I think New American Standard says cared for, uh, but the idea is uh, ministered. Uh, he ministered this letter. Now, how he ministered that letter has been debated, whether he carried the letter or where he, you know, what his involvement was there. But the word minister describes his role in regard to this new covenant as well in chapter 3 and verse 6. It's a ministry of the spirit and of righteousness in chapter 3, verse 7 and verse 9. And this theme, although it starts here, it continues throughout the whole letter. You can look at uh, the bottom of page uh, 5 there in my outline <clears throat> for all the references if you're interested. And so within this broader context, the major focus of Paul's argument in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 is a contrast between these two different kinds of ministries. The ministry of these false teachers that are following after the ministry of Moses <clears throat> and his new covenant ministry, which is a ministry of the Spirit and a ministry that transforms people's hearts. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the, the, the contrast here appears to relate to this awkward situation that he's in, that he has to even defend his own ministry. It doesn't seem that he wants to be there. Uh, the superiority of, of his new ministry, he, he gives three different uh, ways that it's, it's superior. It's greater in glory. Number two, it's unveiled rather than Moses who used to veil himself. And number three, it's, it's transformative. I mean, it has the power to transform people's hearts so that the whole church becomes this living letter to the world. Now, the last thing I want us to look at, <coughs> excuse me, is the Spirit. Now, not everybody sees a, a theme of the Spirit in the letter, and I understand that. But he uses the word Spirit 17 times in the letter, and I give the references. And when, and when viewed in all of their individual contexts, all but five, and maybe, maybe more, maybe three to five, appear to, re, appear to return, uh, allude to the Holy Spirit. Meaning all of those references, with the exception of three to five, are referring to the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is a theme. So what's Paul trying to do with the Holy Spirit theme in this letter? We need to ask ourselves that. We can't just gloss over all those references to the Holy Spirit. What's he trying to get across by using the Holy Spirit so much in this letter? <clears throat> Maybe you've wrestled with that. Well, I think he's emphasizing the role of the Spirit as providing proof of his ministry. For Paul, his ministry is a fulfillment of the promised new covenant in the Old Testament. And as predicted, this covenant involves the spirit, which would bring about transformation of the heart. And these transformed hearts are then able to obey God. <coughs> so Paul sees the spirit as a down payment in the heart. Um, chapter 1, verse 22. Chapter 5, verse 5 is, is the down payment language is used. It's also the source of life. Chapter 3, verse 3, and verse 6. And it's also something Christians share. Chapter 13, and verse 14. So, I think... Um, I'm sorry, go one more. <coughs> All this is culminating up to what I would like to propose as a, as a, a climax <coughs> is in chapter 12, and verse 9, which is outside of my text, but let's just look at that. Um, I think the theme is power and weakness in this letter. I think that central theme allows us to tie in what he's saying in the beginning of the letter and also allow him to understand, allow us to understand how one central theme can also deal with his defense against these Judaizing teachers. His ministry is power and weakness, power displayed in weakness. Their ministry is displayed as uh, letters of recommendation. And, you know, following after, after you know, Judaized teaching, you know, trying to get them to follow the law. And I really like uh, chapter 12 and verse 9. Maybe you, you have another one that kind of captivates this better. When Jesus says to him, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. And I really think that captures the whole theme <coughs> of this letter. Again, you may have other ideas. We can discuss that in the Q&A. <coughs> Excuse me. Now I'd like to move on to the Old Testament context. I don't devote a lot of time to this. I just, I'd, I'll let you do this more with each of your own sections. I think it's helpful when we're preaching to look at the Old Testament references in a letter. Look at them in their individual Old Testament context and see how is the New Testament writer making his argument from these Old Testament texts. He uses at least 15 Old Testament quotations and perhaps as many as 46 allusions. Now, how do you figure out an illusion? Well, you can. there's different debates on how to do that. But even if you look at 
a trusted source, which is the Nestle Align Greek New Testament, which has really good side references. <clears throat> Just as an aside, a lot of us have Bibles like this that have either side reference, bottom references, center column references. <clears throat> you don't have to speak Greek to, to take advantage of these references and, and the Nestle Align Greek New Testament. They're available online. All these scholars, they identify a lot of really good Old Testament allusions and references that you can make use of when you're studying, getting ready to, to preach a text or to teach from a text. But when you look at all these in their context, there's several Old Testament themes that emerge in 2 Corinthians. So what I'm saying again is, if you look at all these 15 Old Testament quotations in 2 Corinthians, and all the 46 allusions throughout the letter, several themes emerge. And here they are. They're, I'm just reading from chapter, uh, page 6 in my outline. Israel's exodus. God's covenant made at Sinai through Moses. The promise of a future exodus or a future redemption. A new covenant or a new creation. And the suffering of the righteous. So what do these have to do with the letter? <clears throat> What's he trying to do? Something to, for us to ask. I don't spend a lot of time developing that in my outline. But I give you, I, there's more that I haven't said that you can read. <clears throat> I want to spend more time developing the Old Testament context of my passage, my section. And he primarily deals with Jeremiah 31, <coughs> Ezekiel 11, Ezekiel 36 and 37, Exodus 32 and 34, through 34, and Genesis 1, possibly Isaiah 9. Now, first of all, in Jeremiah 31, he's claiming that you know, in uh, chapter 3 and verse 2 of St. Corinthians, he's claiming that the Corinthian church is a letter written on the heart. Interesting language there. God had promised in the Old Testament through a prophet Jeremiah that he would bring about a new covenant written on hearts. Jeremiah 31 and 33 says, But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I'll put my law within them, and on their hearts I will write it. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Paul also connects the phrase of new covenant found in Jeremiah 31 as well. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5 and 6, he says that um, God has also made us adequate as servants of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. So what's the connection between the letter of Christ and the new covenant? <clears throat> well, God is the author of the letter. God is the one who's doing this. And this brings to mind another passage. When, when uh, God wrote on the tablets of stone at Mount Sinai, giving the covenant, in Exodus 31, verse 18, when he had finished speaking with him, speaking with Moses, Mount Sinai, he gave Moses the two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone, written by the finger of God. Now, Paul's going to quickly distinguish between the two covenants that he's talking about by clarifying that these are not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of fleshy hearts. Your translation may say tablets of human hearts. This is 2 Corinthians 3, verse 3. <clears throat> now, in some translations, this doesn't really come across too well if it says human hearts. But the contrast between stone and flesh appears to be alluding to Ezekiel. Read with me Ezekiel chapter 36, 26. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. Now, Paul uses the phrase tablets of stone in verse 3. With that use, he's alluding to the book of Exodus. And Exodus 32 tells how Moses brought the tablets of stone down the mountain, and, he, and when he's gonna, God's going to present the covenant to Israel. In Exodus chapter 32, then Moses turned and went down from the mountain with the two tablets of testimony in his hand, Tablets which were written on both sides, they were written on one side and the other. The tablets were God's work, and the writing was God's writing engraved on the tablets. But you know what happened? Moses saw that God's people had rebelled by making the golden calf. He became angry, and he breaks the tablets. <clears throat> and, then God, and then Moses is going to go back up on the mountain, and he's going to seek forgiveness for the people. And God, what does he tell Moses? He tells Moses to go ahead and lead them into the land. However, God's not going to be going with them. And so this upsets everybody. And Moses approaches the Lord at the tent of meeting because he's the only one who's able to speak to the Lord face to face. Exodus 33, 11. 
And Moses seeks the presence of God. And what's interesting in that Old Testament context, he seeks the glorification of all the people, not just himself. <clears throat> Notice, read with me in Exodus chapter 33, verse 13. This is on page 9. I have it quoted there. <coughs> and why am I quoting this? It seems like the original plan was for this nation to be a light to the Gentiles. And they were going to be a light to the Gentiles because they were going to be all glorified in some way. Now, therefore, I pray you, if I found favor in your sight, let me know your ways that I may know you. So that I might find favor in your sight. This is Moses talking. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. And he said, my presence shall go with you and I will give you rest. Then he said, if your presence does not go with us, do not lead us up from here. For how then it can be known that I found favor in your sight, I and your people. Now pay attention here. It is not by your going with us. Is it not by that you're going with us so that we, I and your people, will be glorified above all the other people who are upon the face of the earth? The Lord said to Moses, I will also do this thing in which you've spoken, for you found favor in my sight, and I've known you by name. And Moses said, I pray you, show me your glory. And you're probably familiar with that <coughs> phrase. You may not have connected the fact that what he's asking for originally was that both him and the people would be glorified. What happens is <clears throat> only Moses gets glorified. And so we read next that God ordered Moses to cut two new tablets. He goes up on the mountain, takes the two tablets of stone. He's going to write them on there. And it's at this meeting that God, that, that, that God shows Moses his glory as he calls upon the name of the Lord. That phrase used, calls upon the name of the Lord, Exodus 34 and verse 5. <coughs> And so as Moses comes down the mountain, he doesn't realize that his face has been glorified because his face is shining. You remember another story. People are afraid to come near him. And so he commands everything that the Lord told him to do, and then he puts a veil over his face, and he only takes it off when he would turn back to the Lord, when he would go back into the tent of meeting to get further instructions. So we can notice this passage, this pattern developing. I'm on page 10 of my outline. Moses he would go and, and speak what God said. Afterward, he would put a veil over his face. Then he would remove the veil whenever he went before the Lord. And then he would replace the veil after he had communicated whatever God had told him. But the Israelites never experienced the glory of God because of the hardness of their hearts. So I think that's the Old Testament context there. And then we come to Genesis chapter 1. <coughs> he says in um, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6, For God who said... Light shall shine out of darkness is the one who's shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. So this phrase, light shall shine out of darkness, some people suggested that's going all the way back to Genesis 1. Let there be light. God separated the light from the darkness. And I think it does have that idea there. But it also brings to mind Isaiah 9, which is messianic. He shall make uh, it glorious by the way of the sea. On the other side of the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who walk in darkness will see a great light. For those who live in a dark land, the light will shine upon them, Isaiah 9, 1 and 2. <clears throat> Matthew says that when Jesus settled in Capernaum, that it was a fulfillment of this scripture. So this passage contains the idea of light shining out of darkness. <clears throat> uh, Isaiah 9 also goes on to talk about the child that will be born will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace, in verse 9. So in light of this evidence, it seems that uh, Paul is talking about a new creation that is going to occur. I think that can be substantiated. Tim's going to be talking about this in the morning in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, there's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. <coughs> so these references to... Light shining out of darkness, uh, Jesus coming to bring light, and those in Christ being a new creation. I think all those are not just incidental. They're, bringing, they're drawing upon this Old Testament imagery. <coughs> and so all, these, all this Old Testament context, I think what it's doing is supporting the fact that Paul is a legitimate minister of the gospel. I think that's in the context here. His own ministry of the Spirit is the means by which these... Uh, promises of God are being realized. So let's get into, now that we've spent time talking about that, how much time do I have left? I think you've got about uh, 22 minutes. Okay, good. So 
Let's talk about this contrast of the covenant. Let's talk about the letter of the Spirit. What does this mean? So Paul says that the new covenant is not of the letter, but of the Spirit. Chapter 3 and verse 6. I think he's stressing the life-giving quality of this new covenant. The old covenant brings a curse if everything is not followed. The curse of Deuteronomy chapter 27. (coughs) There's blessings and there's cursings. That's the result of not keeping the law perfectly. It brings death. By contrast, God writes his law within the hearts of those who embrace the new covenant in Christ. This references back to Jeremiah 31. This provides life to those who are formerly dead. And he's contrasting between old and new covenants. It's a way that um, should be understood in view of all the Judaizers who are stressing, you know, Paul should be teaching the law of Moses and, you know, his ministry is not legitimate. Uh, I think that was having some effect on the Corinthian church. But Paul contrasts Christians to the to sons of Israel who have this veil over their hearts when Moses is read. And this veil is taken away in Christ so that the truth can be revealed and shared with others. Now, I'm on page 12. <clears throat> the old covenant has been rendered ineffective or nullified, some translations say. The new covenant remains. Paul's premise is that Moses' ministry is inferior Therefore, his, the Old Covenant is inferior. Uh, the New Covenant has more glory. It's not veiled. Uh, it, uh, it transforms hearts. Now, the most conservative scholars that we would, we would deem conservative, uh, or most of us, I think, they believe in a unified letter, and they read this passage within the larger context of this pervasive Holy Spirit theme. So when they come here and they're trying to understand what the letter and the Spirit contrast is, they take, into con- they take into account that Holy Spirit theme that's running through the letter. <clears throat> now, some people have said, well, we should not. Some people have argued, no, this, this is talking about a figurative interpretation of the law. The letter versus the spirit is a literal interpretation versus a figurative. And I want to address that in part B. Yeah, new hermeneutic, a new way of reading scripture in Christ. Many people say that we should not view this uh, passage as a way of interpreting scripture. And I think that's largely been in opposition as a reaction against people in the early church and later who, you know, they just looked at everything as an allegory. Uh, Other people believe that the Holy Spirit just, you know, removes the veil of literal meaning and just I can intuitively look at the text in any way, you know, it might be true for you and this is true for me. And I think we should all be concerned about those kind of interpretations. But the the Apostle Paul's conversion, and I think this is important for us to get, the Apostle Paul's conversion forced him to look at the Old Testament in a new way. Just think about that. There is a sense in which there's a new hermeneutic in Christ when looking at the Old Testament scriptures. After his experience on the road to Damascus and his conversion, he couldn't read the Old Testament scriptures the same way again. And when he went to the synagogue and he tried to preach Christ from the Old Testament text, He got beat up. They told him that he had gone off the rails. But he insisted that this revelation was not at all in conflict with the original meaning. It was rather a fulfillment. Even in fact, in the first letter, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, he states that scripture was ultimately written as a message to the Christian church. These things are written as an example, right? So Paul had to read the Old Testament differently in Christ. So Paul is contrasting in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, 12 through 18, he's contrasting himself and other Christians to those sons of Israel who have this veil over their hearts when Moses is read. However, in Christ, this veil is taken away so that the truth can be seen and shared. It may be said that Christians apply a new covenant hermeneutic, a new way of looking at scripture. So the early Christians like Origen, who, who kind of argued for an allegorical approach to Old Testament or a non-literal approach, they were wrong in doing that, but they had something. They were, they were right in a little way, and that is you've got to read the Old Testament differently in Christ because it's all pointing to Christ. And both early Christians and early Jews, they both looked at the Old Testament scriptures and agreed that the Old Testament scriptures looked forward to a future redemption and restoration of God's people. However, it was only Paul in the early church that insisted that the scriptures were pointing to the salvation which had taken place in Christ. <clears throat> 
The Jews didn't believe that. So let's look at the final issue with this text, and that's the glory behind the veil. What's up with the veil of Moses? Hey, I get to talk about head coverings again. (laughs) So what, what what makes it more difficult for understanding this again is the New Testament, um, the way it's translated, again, I, you know, I'm not trying to come across as some uh, Greek scholar, but I really think it's helpful to find themes when we can consistently see a word translated. <clears throat> and, the, and a lot of the modern translations make this more difficult for us. Um, for instance, this word that's often translated as um, fading in a lot of words. Do you, do you, uh, th- th- was the glory uh, fading in your translation? The glory of Moses fading? Or is it nullified? <coughs> Rendered ineffective? Abolished, if you have a older version? Passing away? Passing away. New, New American Standard, which I, my normal Bible, I read that a lot, it, it says fading, and I really, it's unfortunate that they do that. They, this, uh, this Greek word that's used four times in chapter 3, verse 7, and verse 11, and verse 13, and verse 14, uh, they don't translate it consistently. And, and when you look at in the, the, the dictionaries, the lexicons, there's really no um, justification for, for translating it as fading from the, from the Greek dictionaries. A better translation would be to render ineffective or something like fading or nullifying or something like that. And so why do all the modern, why do some of the modern translations translate it as fading? There doesn't seem to be any support for it. Does anybody say fading, by the way? <clears throat> you must have a New American Standard. Okay. God bless you. I like that version. <clears throat> but even these translations, they're not consistent. It's unfortunate they're not consistent because they'll translate it fading, and then when you get down to verse 314, they translate the same verse as removed. Same, same word as removed. Um, or take away or set aside. Something else. So they're not even consistent with themselves. Uh, so I, I presented my humble attempt to provide a consistent translation on page 14 of my outline from 2 Corinthians chapter 3, 7 through verse 15. You can look at that in your own time. <clears throat> and I, I propose rendered ineffective allows us to see consistently what this argument is that he's doing. Um, and if the ministry of death and uh, letters written on stones came in glory so that the sons of Israel are not able to stare into the face of Moses on account of the glory of his face, which is being rendered ineffective, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be in more glory? And I go on, and, and I ask the question, how does rendered ineffective apply to the glory on his face? Was it really fading? This is the question that we've often asked as we look at the text. Uh, in verse 13, it says that they would not stare unto the end of the thing being rendered ineffective. And many have understood that to mean that his glory was fading away. And I think that's why they use, use in their justification that, <clears throat> that uh, being done away means fading away. And I think that's a little too interpretive. It's not, the problem is, is that's not mentioned in the Exodus account. Does that make sense? So when you, you take that interpretive approach to the New Testament, and then a, a, a critic or somebody who's not a believer, they go back and read Exodus, they don't see Moses' face fading. In fact, if you, even if you look at the Jewish commentators, they, they say that his, his face just kept on showing glory. In fact, if you dug him up, uh, it, you know, there would be glory coming out of the hole. And so that's the idea. Uh, I think it undermines uh, the text of the Old Testament. So what was Paul doing here? Was he just making up stories or was he taking things out of context but we can still trust him? I think there's a different explanation. Uh, We know from the text that I talked about earlier that Moses was begging the Lord to remain in the midst of Israel, and he expected that both he and the people would be glorified. We also know that the people of Israel were obstinate, and they continued to rebel against God even after the renewal of the covenant, and as a result, only Moses experienced that transforming glory of the Lord. And the people were afraid of God's glory, reflected on the face of Moses, so he put on the veil. And the, glor- the glorification that Moses expected never actually went to the all the people. It was rendered ineffective by the veil. See that? The glory was rendered ineffective by the veil. 
because of the hardness of their hearts. <clears throat> in this reading, the end of the thing being rendered ineffective could be paraphrased as the end goal of the glory which was being blocked. The end goal of the glory was the glorification of all the people. However, up to that point, up to the very point of the day that Paul was living, the hearts of Israel remained hardened whenever the Old Testament was read. And so God's glory remained veiled. But in Christ, the veil was removed. In this example, the veil in Moses' face becomes a veil over the heart, verse 15. And when someone turns to the Lord, just like Moses would turn back to Moses, uh, turn back to the God, turn back to the tent and remove that veil. <clears throat> Here, uh, Paul says, whenever someone turns to the Lord, verse 16, the veil is taken away. Beautiful uh, imagery there of, of what Moses was doing in the Old Testament. Unfortunately, under the Old Testament, Moses is the only one that's glorified. Under the New Covenant, God's glory is available to all who will turn to the Lord. Verse 16. So the climax of Paul's argument is verse 18. But we all with unveiled face, behold as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord, are being transformed to the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. <coughs> we can talk more about that verse. If you want to, how much time do I have? You have five minutes. Okay, let me finish up. I really want to talk about the beholding in a mirror. How does this mirror imaging work? In your, in your, oh, you shouldn't do that to people. So how, how should we, how should we view the mirror? Have you ever wrestled with that? Are we, are we looking at the gospel in a mirror? Are we looking at Christ in the mirror? What's the mirror doing? You know, are we reflecting in a mirror? How does this work? And I think depending on the translation, you're going to have come up with different answers. The translators wrestle with this, but I really think it should be thought of as, um, reflecting like a mirror. The use of this word in ancient Greek literature, from my research at least, involves both optics and mirrors. It's, if you look at the use of this word in Greek literature, it's usually used around the topic of optics and mirrors. And so considering that we already have a mention of an image, what's the image? Image of God. <clears throat> in the verse, it's not hard to see the mirror idea. But how's it being used? In the context... Paul identifies the church as the letter, you know, the thing that is viewed, the proof of his ministry in the world, the commendation letter. And so I make an argument here, and I don't like to talk too technical, but, you know, there's different, there's different, for, there's different forms of verbs in the Greek. This is a middle form, which means, you know, how, how are we supposed to, is it should be translated, they are themselves mirroring God's glory. That's what I kind of argue for in the, in the paper on, verse, on page 16. That they, they are themselves mirroring God's glory. <clears throat> and they are also being transformed in the process. So in this reading, from glory to glory fits that idea and the thought of an image being bounced off a mirror. The last phrase, even as from the Lord, can be seen as the source of that. <clears throat> So Paul goes on to say that the image of God in this analogy is Christ. Chapter 4 and verse 4. That God's glory is seen in the face of Christ. Verse 6 of chapter 4. And this glory is brought about in his ministry by the handling of the word. Which he talks about in, in chapter 4 in the beginning. Which is the manifestation of truth. Appealing to every man's conscience. Verse 2. This is the gospel. He talks about in verse 3. That he preaches. Verse 5 which is at sometimes still veiled. Now, why does he have to mention it's still veiled? Because if this is such a public display, why doesn't everybody believe it? It's because the God of this age is blinding them. Now, I don't go into a lot of detail about who the God of the age is debate, but I have in a footnote there that Satan is mentioned several times in this letter, and I think he's talking about Satan there. So in conclusion, I really think that 2 Corinthians 3 should be read in the context of these themes, commendation, sufficiency, ministry, and these spirit, the spirit, those themes. Now, it's not an exhaustive list of themes in the book, so as you come to later chapters, you may want to tease out new themes. I think those are the ones that are most applicable to this uh, section. They also help us see the whole letter as a unified uh, piece of work, and they should influence our reading here. In the context uh, of his scriptural quotations as well and his allusions, I think as we look at those, they provide the information that's necessary for us to determine 
a valid interpretation of it. So as we're reading one commentator and this other commentator, we need to be asking, well, how does this person's opinion fit within those themes of the letter? If we agree with those themes, how does this guy's interpretation fit within those themes? Or how does this guy's interpretation jive with his use of the Old Testament text to make his argument? And so Paul is commending his ministry of the new covenant as a fulfillment of God's promised redemption and restoration through the Holy Spirit. That's the fulfillment of the promises. The Corinthian church is the proof of that ministry as they reflect God's glory into the world. They're being transformed into the image of God as they behold the face of Christ in the gospel. And I kind of try to, at the end here on page 17, I just try to tie this in with the whole, one of the overarching themes of the whole Bible. You know, in the beginning, God created man in his own image. But throughout history, man's sin, he's, he's rebelled, he's tarnished that image. But through Paul's new covenant ministry of the Spirit, man's being restored back into the image of God, back into the image of God through the gospel, into the, in the face of Jesus Christ. So this image is first seen in Christ, and then it's reflected back into the world. And so I leave you with this question. What's going to be the proof of our ministry? What's going to be the proof of our ministry? For Paul, it was the proof of transformed hearts in the people that he worked with. They were written, they were public proof of his ministry in the gospel. It wasn't a letter of recommendation or where he did a preacher internship or what degree he got from this college or that college or his family's reputation or what lineage he came from or it wasn't even his public speaking ability. Uh, Kieran's going to talk more about later all these accusations that they, that they were making against him. He's defending himself in this letter. <clears throat> but for him, the proof was the people that he served and the changed lives. I, I pray that God would do the same in our ministry. Because it's not, it's not based on our eloquence. It's not based on how smart I am or if I know the middle form of some obscure <clears throat> Greek word, you know. It's going to be a working of God through the gospel. And I'm looking forward to Tim's talk tomorrow. He's going to show us how we do that. It's going to be power and weakness. Power and weakness. It's going to be suffering, righteous suffering. And I appreciate your time. Thank you.